The chance to shape your future is here. Learn and connect with exciting new opportunities. Are you ready for the next step? Hello and good morning and welcome to this Emerging Tech Fest session on inspection and autonomy. The efficient manufacturing with assured and repeatable quality of often complex and difficult to manufacture products is vital to a company's success. Being able to inspect the product efficiently and accurately is a key part of the design and verification process. In this session, it is my pleasure to be able to introduce to you this morning some experts who collectively have many decades of experience working in the design, the manufacturing and the delivery of products serving different sectors. They will be sharing with you their own different and fascinating insights and perspectives. We will be first hearing from Gareth, then Ian. There will be time for questions and answers at the end, so please raise them during each presentation and I will pose them in the discussion at the end. So now over to Gareth, who will introduce himself and start off the presentations today. Gareth, over to you. Thank you, Rob. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, as it will be very soon. Um, my presentation this morning is entitled uh, The Trend in Manufacturing Inspection Towards Flexibility and Autonomy. Um, my background, by the way, is uh, in manufacturing and production engineering. Um, I'm the CMM and Gauging Business Development Manager at Renishaw. I've worked at Renishaw for uh, nearly 25 years now. And prior to that, I spent 10 years in the defence industry. So this is something I'm, I'm, I'm passionately uh, involved with. Uh, and something I'd like to share uh, the next 15 minutes of, of some thoughts and, and welcome your, your questions at the end. So our agenda today, um, I'll give you a very brief introduction to who Renishaw are, for those of you who don't know us. I'll pose the question, what is driving this flexibility and autonomy? And what are manufacturers demanding from us? Uh, and then I'll, I'll give you some examples of some of the technologies that are being chosen. So Renishaw, we're a uh, company listed on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, we're in the FTSE 250. We employ uh, just under four and a half thousand people. Um, many of those uh, here in the UK, our headquarters are here in South Gloucestershire. And our flagship manufacturing facility is at Miskin in South Wales. For those of you familiar with the area, that's M4 Junction 34. Um, some of the products that we design, manufacture and supply uh, include the smart manufacturing technologies that we'll be talking about in this presentation, but we're also involved in neurosurgery. We have a, a brain surgery robot that we supply to the medical industry. Uh, we're the UK's only manufacturer of metal 3D printing machines, so we supply those and many more that we really just don't have time for this morning. So quite a wide breadth. So let's dive straight in. What, what are the drivers for change in the industry at the moment? Well, let, let's pick up on one, which is the electrification in the automotive industry. Um, electrification is just one of the, the things that's happening in the automotive industry. The automotive industry is being tipped on its head at the moment. It's either a terrifying or a very exciting time to be involved. Um, some of the um, things that are um, key at the moment are things like um, CO2 emissions. Um, you can go back to the end of 2015, the Paris Climate Agreement, where CO2 emission targets were signed up to by the members that, that joined. America signed at the time, they've taken a bit of time out, and last week they said they're coming back in again, so that's, that's good news. So the government are driving most of this change with legislation. It isn't really um, individuals that are choosing this and, and, and please forgive me if you're someone who's passionate about the environment and you've already bought an electric car um, but you're you're in the sort of the bottom or, or the top uh, five or ten percent there 
Places like Norway are ahead of us. They've uh, got a 50% uptake take of electric vehicles, but it's, it's government legislation that's driving this change, make no mistake. So last year, the UK government put out a 10 point plan uh, of how it was going to tackle CO2 emissions to hit the Paris Climate Agreement targets. And just one of those included tailpipe emissions from the automotive industry. And that led to the UK announcing that they were going to ban the sale of petrol and diesel cars by 2030. It had previously been 2035. They have brought that forward to 2030. So what does that mean? What does that mean to, to me and you? Well, that means that in nine years time, you will not be able to buy a car in the UK that is powered purely by a petrol or a diesel engine. It will have to be a hybrid or it will have to be a battery electric vehicle. It's, it's still not clear um, exactly what type of hybrids are gonna be allowed, um, but essentially we won't be able to buy a petrol or a diesel car. That means that manufacturers have the need for new manufacturing processes. We're talking about electric powertrains here. So what, what do we mean by electric powertrains? Well, I think it's useful to understand what we're losing and what we're gaining. So we're losing about 30% of the components in an electric powertrain compared to an internal combustion engine. So no longer have we got any timing belts, uh, turbos, catalytic converters, head gaskets, big end bearings, exhaust gas recirculation valves, or, or the exhaust itself. None of those will appear on your garage bill because none of them are now in that vehicle. The vehicle that you buy in nine years time will have basically three things. It'll have a battery, it'll have an electric motor, and it'll have a high-speed gearbox, a simple but high-speed gearbox. A, a, an internal combustion engine will run at maybe 6,000 RPM as a maximum speed. Uh, these electric motors are running at something like 18,000 RPM. So although, although it's a simpler gearbox, it has to run at a higher speed. The second thing, uh, it's, it's unavoidable, um, um, but the pandemic. The pandemic has meant that companies are reshoring their manufacturing. They're seeing a drop in sales and they're, they're beginning to bring their manufacturing back, uh, mainly from the, from the East. And this is happening in the States and this is certainly happening in Europe. So what that means is if you're bringing your manufacturing back to Europe, then you are inevitably dealing with a higher labor cost than you were in maybe places like China or India. You have the added uh, difficulty of employing social distancing measures. And this all adds up to the fact that the cost of not automating your process has suddenly gone up. So I don't think that there's a, a bigger drive for automation. It's just the fact that the alternative of not automating is suddenly more expensive. And the third thing is that we have disruptive companies providing alternatives. I'm talking about the automotive industry here when I talk about this. So we've got people who've never made cars before who are now getting involved. People like Apple and Google are talking about making cars. Um, it's interesting to understand that the latest generation of purchasers no longer see cars as aspirational status symbols. That this has been the case in the past. People now are beginning to see cars as a liability, both to purchase, to replace all of those parts that I listed off earlier on, um, to even pass your test is, is an expensive um, um, thing to do these days. So they're looking for alternatives. The latest generation of people are looking for alternatives. And one thing that's been suggested that certainly will take hold in cities is ride hailing and ride sharing. Now, I used to call these things taxis, but essentially what you're doing is you're using that service on a case by case basis to get from A to B. You no longer go out on a Sunday and polish a shiny car that you've um, fallen in love with. You don't see that as, as aspirational. You get all of the, uh, um, um, everything you need from a ride, ride hailing and a ride sharing service. Now, a very interesting point here. You're still the end user of that journey to go to A to B, but you are no longer the specifier of the vehicle. In fact, many people I ask, and I enjoy asking them this, if they've got into a vehicle and got back out again, ask them what type it was or what make it was. And many people can't tell you, they're just not interested. Now that may be interesting or not to you, 
But the point here is that the person that's buying those vehicles is now no longer you. It is now somebody who's buying a fleet of vehicles. And all of a sudden, the status that the brand has is diminished. If I'm a hard-nosed purchaser and I'm buying a lot of vehicles, cost and efficiency is king. Performance is suddenly very, very important. So assuming that that's the case, the manufacturer needs a process which is very efficient. The good design is obviously important, but a good process to create that design is also very important. So there's the drivers for change. Um, what are manufacturers asking? What are they demanding from, from, I'm thinking from a powertrain perspective here? One of the first things is flexibility. It's now no longer good enough to have a dedicated single purpose device in a line, in a production line. Uh, what we're, we're talking about here, pe people in, uh, the analogy people use here is the Swiss Army knife or the smartphone. A little while ago, a smartphone, or a phone rather, did nothing more than make phone calls. It now does phone calls, it'll call a ride hailing service for you, it's a calculator, it's a camera, it's a whole host of things. So it's a multifunctional device. If we're to increase efficiency and reduce costs, these multifunctional devices will maximize or must maximize your capital investment. So you're asking one piece of equipment to be flexible enough for new designs coming down the line and also to do the job of a couple of three different pieces of equipment that it would traditionally have been used for. Smart technologies are being asked for. Um, there's, there's buzzwords like industry 4.0 um, banded around, but essentially what people are wanting are processes with logic built into them. You don't want someone standing there monitoring the process. It wants logic built in to be able to reset itself automatically. And it also needs the capability for self-adjustment. And that's absolutely key. It's something Renishaw's done for 30 plus years. Um, and it's something that we've got a, a great deal of experience of. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and the fourth thing is faster results. If you have an inline or an atline inspection process that isn't centralized, that gives you huge benefits. Sending a part off to go away to get inspected, to come back with the results hours later, just isn't what's happening these days. You either want to validate the part as good to continue, or you want to adjust the process. And you need fast, fast results for that. So intelligent process control is about logging inspection results very quickly after a part has been manufactured. It's about monitoring process drift and then automatically adjusting an upstream process in real time. So to give you an example of what you might be seeing there in that process drift, you may be seeing uh, gradual tool wear or you may be seeing the effect of temperature change, which means the parts come out of a slightly different size. And you want to make um, constant small updates to the process before you run out of tolerance, your tolerance bands. Um, and the use of flexible five axis inspection technologies, which I'm going to go into in a moment. We've got a system um, called Revo, which enables multi sensors to be put onto uh, a single uh, inspection head. And that also gives you improved feature access. So here's a picture. Here's a back to back comparison. On the left hand side, we've got a three axis system. On the right hand side, we've got a five axis system. The three axes on the left indicated in red are the simple X, Y, Z axes of a coordinate measuring machine. And on the right, we combine those first three axes with two more rotary axes. Now I'll just press the video here. You can see that the scan path on the left-hand side is created by the machine having to move, and that, that creates a problem. On the right-hand side, the machine can be either still, or the machine is kept still, um, um, or, or kept very slow, and the head carries most of the measurement out. So you'll see here on the right-hand side, the head will spin and capture the data, and it captures the data much, much faster than the system on the left-hand side. And there's a very good reason for that. If I can go back to a car analogy, if you're driving a car or you're a passenger in a car, and you accelerate, or you brake, or you swing the steering wheel left or right, you're thrown around inside the vehicle. The inertial forces at play move you in the vehicle. Those same inertial forces are at play here on the CMM, but instead of throwing you around, they create errors. 
So to minimize those errors, you slow the machine down. And that's what you're seeing there on the left-hand side. If you don't have the machine moving at all and you use a, a responsive um, head, the Revo head to take that data, you can capture data far, far faster and still maintain accuracy. So there's a multi-sensor family. So you've got the Revo head up at the top and you can select automatically a number of different sensors. Uh, and there's new ones to come out in the future, which is, is represented by the question mark. Um, you wouldn't use all of these, but you could use all of these. So your CMM might only use the first two sensors for a year or two, and then you suddenly get a new design down the pipeline and you choose different sensors. If we can look at those first two sensors, the surface finish sensor and the high speed scanning sensor that we've just seen in the video. A case study here would be conventionally, a three axis CMM would take your dimensional inspection data and then you'd move that part on to a manual gauging station. Two bits of equipment, potentially two people to operate them. Two bits of capital, two bits of floor space taken up. Why not take this and compress these, co collapse these into one CMM, uh, which can not only capture the high speed inspection data, but also capture your surface finish data at the same time. So you're maximizing your capital investment. To give you some sort of an idea of times and speeds, I've got a, gra a graph here which shows three different automotive parts. First of all, a gearbox case, and then secondly, a valve body from an automatic gearbox, and then thirdly, a cylinder block. And in blue, we have the cycle times that we achieved with a three axis system, 35, 33 and a half, and 39 minutes. And in each case, we then duplicated that measurement with the five axis system. And that dark orange band represents the, the time savings. So you can see that we've gone from 35 minutes in this gearbox case down to just over 15 minutes. And that extra time allows you to either measure more components or use fewer CMMs or fill some of that time with additional measurements like surface finish. So you can see here the 21.8 minutes is now our full cycle time for not only the dimensions, but also the surface finish. Um, this last example here shows an EV part. This is a, a, a data, sorry, it's not, it's a rotor from um, an electric vehicle um, motor. It's a hairpin motor, and we're using a, a vision sensor, the Revo Vision Probe, to come down and to measure things like paper height and paper condition, and then the um, positions of some of these connectors. So we are using multi sensors here. We don't have to use a rotary table in this case, which can be expensive, to capture all of the data needed. So, in summary, there are some very strong drivers in the industry for flexibility and automation. Inspection has a key role in that manufacturing process. And Renishaw has some five axis inspection technologies, which provide many advantages to, in that regard. And thank you, that's me finished. Any questions? We would take those at, at the end. Uh, you want to take those right at the end, okay. Yeah, yeah, Gareth, I'll, I'll collect them. Uh, th thank you, Gareth. Absolutely fascinating and really interesting to see that the technology being used and deployed in measurement is just as sophisticated, if not so, as the products that you're measuring. And uh, absolutely brilliant to see the real benefits in terms of time from a production facility. You can obviously see what that means in terms of production throughput, but also assured product quality which is absolutely key to delivering quality product to market repeatedly. So thank you for that. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Ian, uh, who's going to give a slightly different insight onto this. So, so, so Ian, um, over to you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully I can get the system to work and you're gonna be able to see my screen. Uh, fabulous, looks like it's working. Good. Um, okay, uh, that was a fascinating presentation uh, that we've just seen from Gareth, and um, uh, it's interesting that uh, his perspective is about dimensional measurement uh, and about surface finish measurement, which are essentially surface things. What I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, inspection of the actual product itself to look for defects and flaws that result from the manufacturing process. 
So this type of robotic inspection isn't designed for uh, the accuracy that's required for CMM measurement. It's designed around providing the accuracy that's required to detect the types and sizes of defects that need to be found within a particular component. So uh, my name is Ian Cooper. Uh, I'm a technology fellow at TWI and I've been involved in NDT in various phases um, for the last 30 years or so. Most of you will be familiar with TWI due from our, our welding and joining expertise. But if you're going to join materials together and you want them to stay together, then of course inspection forms a vital part of that process. Uh, and our uh, NDT uh, and NDE activities have grown to a point where we now uh, have uh, nearly 70 people involved in, in development and application of NDE technologies. And they're based in three locations throughout the UK. Um, in Middlesbrough, in Cambridge in our headquarters, and in Port Albert in South Wales, uh, which is where most of this work has been carried out. So the drivers for robotic inspection then are, are really a case of uh, needing to drive down the cost. Um, NDT is often seen as an unpalatable burden, uh, but in actual fact, if it's deployed properly, it can be a huge saving in that it can reduce your amount of scrap. And as Rob mentioned, it too can provide feedback to your manufacturing process so that you can make corrections to that process long before you start to make scrap material. Um, in this case, uh, where the project started looking at complex composite materials for the aerospace industry. And uh, that means that we need to inspect all of every part. And of course, the freedoms that the use of composites and materials like additively manufactured uh, components means that there are design freedoms that, that, that produce very complex shapes very often. Uh, and these are beyond the abilities of conventional two-dimensional automated systems. Uh, and so we needed to develop something that was rather more dexterous that can cope with these shapes. But we wanted to uh, improve on the inspection times that are typically achieved with manual inspection and also to reduce the variability that can occur when a manual operator is performing the inspections. So uh, on with the show, as it were. Um, the vehicle that we've used to do this development is a, a program called Intercom, which is now in its third iteration. Um, and we needed to develop uh, a, a rapid inspection system that had as low a startup cost as possible. Uh, and so six axis robotic manipulators seem to be the obvious choice. They're produced in huge quantities. They're extremely reliable and they're uh, available throughout uh, industry. Um, they can be waterproof, which suits us if we're going to be squirting water around. Uh, and they're very uh, quickly repaired because of the commonality of, of parts across the various systems. Uh, and in, in this particular case, uh, the challenges that have prevented us from doing this in the past have been the fact that the robots were unable to report their position fast enough for us to be able to maintain meaningful scanning speeds. But that's all changed now. The interfaces are much more advanced and we can talk to the robots um, much more efficiently than we could previously. Um, the features that we need to develop are offline path planning. What I mean by that is if we have a complex shape component, we want to be able to take the CAD data, read it into a piece of software, and then based on the dimensions of the tool and what it's doing, achieve a scan path that enables us to cover all the areas of interest on the part. Um, assuming we can move the robots in the right places, then we then need an inspection medium. So in this case, we chose ultrasound because that's the most widely used uh, inspection method for composites. Uh, but we wanted to go further than just a single transducer uh, taking point measurements as it goes along. We wanted to in introduce some of the new technologies like phased array, which enable us to scan uh, a swathe uh, of uh, uh, a path uh, two inches wide. And this means we achieve much faster coverage, but without the need to move the robot very fast because we're scanning multiple scan lines at the same time. Ultrasound doesn't travel very well through the air and it's reflected from a, an air composite interface. And so we use water as a medium to carry the ultrasound from the transducer into the part. So we need to develop squirter systems that are able to produce a nice laminar flow that doesn't induce noise into, into the part. Uh, it'd be good if we could use other methods, uh, infrared, for instance, thermography and radiography. Um, if we're going to inspect really complex shaped parts, then it would be great if our imaging wasn't just uh, restricted to a flat 
planar 2D image, it would be good if we could image the part in three dimensions and, and image the defect within that part in three dimensions too. And it'd be also good if when we place the component into the cell that we don't have to have microscopic precision. If we want to automatically or rapidly place the part into the cell, there's got to be a certain amount of, of tolerance to that process. Essentially, if you put a component into a robotic cell, you, you need to ask yourself three questions. First of all, is it the part that the component that the cell is expecting? So you need to be able to identify the part. Secondly, the robot needs to know that it's going to be in the place in the cell that it expects to find it. Uh, and thirdly, the part shape has got to conform to the CAD from which you originally derived the scan path. And if the answer to any of those questions is no, then you've got to deal with that in, in some way. And uh, of course, if you want to take the inspection outside of the cell uh, or move the, uh, uh, the transducer in any way other than using the robot, then you need to be able to track that sensor's position so that you can use what we call encoded scans or maps of, of the component. So here's a little video uh, of the existing uh, and the, the initial system working. So here you can see the two robots are scanning different areas of the same part, but they can work collaboratively and cooperatively. For instance, if we wanted to use a technique known as through transmission, where one transducer transmits the sound and another transducer receives the sound on the opposite side of the part, the two robots can work collaboratively to achieve that. Or indeed, they could be scanning uh, two completely separate parts in the same area of the cell. Um, this inspection took around uh, 40 hours using manual techniques, but using the robots, uh, it was reduced to less than nine hours. So a significant saving uh, in time. And of course, uh, a, a lot more repeatability of the inspection, a lot more consistency in the inspection. Um, we had to write some software to enable us to, uh, to generate these 3D images. So here you can see what we call a time of flight scan of the part. So color represents thickness here, but we can also uh, represent amplitude of the reflected signal. Uh, on a grayscale or color palette too. And uh, if we zoom in on this, you can see four squares, which are deliberately induced flaws. They're actually PTFE inserts. One's 12 millimeters, one six, and the smallest one you can see the green cursor on is, is three millimeters. And um, we uh, are able to uh, show, um, let me just grab a laser pointer. We're able to display this as what we call a B scan. So this is a slice down through the component. This is a top down view. This is a slice down through the component. Here's the top surface, here's the bottom surface, and here's our tape insert that's within the material. Uh, and down here is what we call an A scan. So this is time going left to right along this axis, amplitude of the reflected signal here. And this line is uh, uh, the scan that's resulted from this black line on the B scan. And over on the left hand side, we have a whole range of tools that enable us to size flaws and, and log indications and, and all the things that you would expect in, in a, a fully featured set of analysis software. Of course, that, that works very well where the front and back surface of the component are parallel to each other. But if we have a shape such as this aeros aerofoil, where the front and back surface are not parallel and the part changes thickness, then uh, two things happen. First of all, if we're doing a through transmission scan, we need to make sure that the water path remains constant. And that means that we have to move the probes apart from each other as we do the scan. So the two transducers need to remain, the two robots need to remain coordinated, um, but they need to vary their position with respect to each other as a function of the part geometry. So here I've turned the water off and uh, I'll run this uh, and you can see what I mean. So because the ultrasound is reflect, refracted at the surface, the, part, the uh, um, probes have to change their position, their angle with respect to each other and to the surface to make sure that they're in a, the right place to deliver and capture uh, the ultrasound. So that was Intercom 1. Intercom 2 then came along and we wanted to take all that technology that we'd uh, developed and uh, we wanted to be able to deploy that on much larger components. So here you can see uh, our artist impression of what that might look like. So it's a caged cell with two very large robots, payload of around 125 kilograms per robot. 
They move on 10 meter tracks, so they can scan very large components like wing skins and spars. And at the far end is a rotating turntable that enables us to scan both large cylindrical components, but interestingly, also allows us to manipulate parts of other shapes in order to present them at the best orientation for the robots to be able to, to scan, uh, particularly if they're scanning collaboratively when they both need to be able to reach the part. Eventually that materializes a real thing within our facility. And here are a couple of views, this from the, uh, the end where the control panel sits and this view from the turntable end. And this gives you some idea of the size of the thing. The crane that you can see there is a, a five ton uh, crane running overhead that helps us deliver parts into the cell. Um, the system can uh, take uh, items that are 10 meters long uh, and four meters in diameter on the turntable. Um, parts will actually fit into the cell that are up to 14 meters long, but we might not be able to reach all areas for scanning, but at least you know, we can fit the parts in there. And we can cope with objects that are up to five meters high before we start interfering with the, uh, the lighting and, and the overhead crane operation. So um, here's the same cell, but this time uh, it's got the winglet in there that uh, you saw in the first video. Uh, and I'd now like to run a, another short two minute video that just shows um, the, the robotic system in, in operation. So um, a few arty shots to start with from our, uh, our videographers. Um, this shows the actual checking of the scan path. So once you've developed the scan path offline, you then need to run that very carefully to make sure that there are no errors in that that are going to collide with your part and damage it. Um, this is the uh, control panel for the robot. And here we're initiating a scan. The scans are initiated remotely. Uh, here it's the same transducer that you saw previously. It scans a swathe about two inches wide. But here, because of the uh, additional torque and strength of the robot, we've deployed, deployed the sensor on a, a long reach uh, end effector, which enables us to reach into components where we might have enclosed spaces uh, that we might want to inspect. Um, here you can see our, our operator using the software that I showed earlier um, to uh, analyze the, the results of the part and again, the tape inserts and so on. So now what we're going to show you is, is uh, the use of the two robots working together with the turntable to scan a fan blade. Now, we're showing through transmission here to show the dexterity of the part, but in actual fact, that technique wouldn't have worked here because this is a hollow blade. But nonetheless, it shows very nicely the way that you can use the turntable in conjunction with the two robots. This is the offline path planning process where we develop the two scan paths. You can see they're working together to cover this this very complex shape, which uh, has a twist of over 45 degrees in it, getting, getting on for 90 degrees, in fact. So the turntable enables us to present the part at the optimum position to enable us to, uh, to reach all areas of it with, with both robots. Okay. So uh, if you remember, I said we need to answer three questions when we put uh, a part into the cell. Uh, firstly, we need to be sure it's the right part. Secondly, we need to be sure it's in the right place. And thirdly, we need to make sure that it conforms to the CAD geometry. But what happens if you don't have the CAD geometry? Maybe that the part has, has sprung when it's come out of the mold and it's a completely different shape to the CAD data. Or maybe it's a legacy part for which you've lost or you, you don't have access to the CAD data. But one of the things that we can do is uh, we can integrate this uh, laser line scanner uh, into the system. Uh, and we can scan the part and generate a point cloud. Now that point cloud can then be used with the offline path planning software to generate a scan path. So it removes the need to, to have scan data from, from all cases. Uh, something else that we need to consider is how we calibrate the tool. So, um, in machining, it's called the tool center point. This is the action part of the tool that actually interfaces with, with the component. We need to be sure when we're swapping tools and putting different end effectors on 
that we know exactly where this tool center point is so that we get the right effect and we don't collide with the part. Um, another thing we need to be able to do is calibrate the position of the component. So there are a couple of ways that we can do this, but one of them involves the use of our friend, the laser line scanner again. So in this case, we scan an object that's in this case, a sphere that's in a fit, fixed known position within the cell. And this enables us to very accurately calibrate the tool center point. Um, and then we can scan certain parts of the component as well within the cell. And again, that will help us identify the part and to confirm its position within the cell. We can use exactly the same process if we uh, have um, an ultrasonic probe uh, attached to the end effector. Um, the advantage of using this process over using a fixed pointer is that the water path, of course, is very much a fluid medium and it's very difficult to take measurements of the end point of the water path where it's going to interface with the part. So by using a live scan and uh, inspecting the surface of this sphere through the water path, we get to calibrate the tool center point very precisely uh, for, for the uh, array. So uh, I mentioned earlier that we might want to do inspections outside of the robotic safety cell, or alternatively, we might want to calibrate the robot's positions with respect to each other or monitor that to make sure that we're getting good data. Uh, and one of the ways that we can do this is using photogrammetry. So here you can see we've installed eight cameras uh, around the cell. Uh, and these can be set up on tripods if we want to scan outside the cell, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, we need to have a line of sight um, to the object that we're monitoring um, from at least two of the cameras, uh, but it's usually possible to contrive it in a fixed environment like this so that you get fairly consistent uh, line of sight to, to most of the, of the camera systems. What we're actually tracking is a reflective ball um, and the cameras are emitting and sensing uh, infrared light and uh, we can track uh, hundreds of components at the same time. It's very analogous to what you might have seen uh, where people want to perfect their golf swing and they put on a black suit that's covered with lots of reflective dots and a photogrammetry system tracks the relative movement of the, the dots and analyzes the posture and the, and the swing action. Well, this is exactly the same thing. We, we can do this uh, for the robot system. Um, the accuracy varies throughout the volume of the cell. Uh, and so there's software that comes with the, uh, with the system that enables you to determine what the accuracy is at various points. As you move closer to a camera, the accuracy drops off, but you've got a sweet spot in the middle of the inspection volume where you know that the, um, the sensitivity and the accuracy is within the limits that, that, that you need. And you can use this program to determine that uh, and make sure that you get resolution. Here we're achieving uh, 0.02 of a millimeter, which is way above what we need for conventional NDT inspection. So here's an example of a, a probe. So this is the, the same transducer that you might see uh, inside the water squirter nozzle, but here it's taken outside the nozzle and it's mounted uh, into this holder. And we've attached three reflectors and that enables us to track the movement within six degrees of freedom. Like so. So what that then enables us to do is, is, is it enables us to do essentially freehand scanning, but still encode the position because we're still tracking the location of the probe within a high degree of accuracy. Of course, if you're not moving that according to a pre-programmed path, the operator needs to be able to see which bits of the component he scanned and which bits he hasn't. And so this image over on the top right hand corner here shows in red the area to be scanned and in green the bits that you've done already. And it builds up um, an image of the component in exactly the same way as is uh, done with the, with the robotic inspection. And down the left hand side, you've got uh, all the usual tools and analysis uh, features that enable you to uh, sentence the part, and examine the part. So here's an example of where we took that system and uh, we deployed it in a boatyard belonging to uh, our partner RNLI in the Intercom program, they were interested in scanning some areas of potential impact damage on the hull of the vessel. So we took our cameras and mounted them on tripods. Um, the system is very clever in as much as once you've positioned all your tripods, the cameras all talk to each other and they work out where they are with respect to each other. So you wind up with a, an established local coordinate reference frame. 
Um, you then pick a couple of unique identifiers on the part that you're going to inspect and feed that into the system. And that then gives you the reference frame for the component you're going to inspect. Once you've got all that, you can then go ahead and scan the part and the data is collected and plotted in the right place on the 3D model uh, of the component. And of course, um, we're doing this all outside of a safety cell and it's extremely deployable and very easy for us to take on site. So for aircraft inspection, we could do this on the ramp, for instance, or we could do it in the hangar. Uh, and because we could use any end effector, in this case, we're using a roller probe. Um, it's an ultrasonic array can turn within a wheel. Here, we don't need to squirt tens of liters of water. Um, we can just wet the surface and uh, scan away. So um, what else are we hoping to achieve with the intercom program then? Well, um, we're, we're hoping to incorporate thermography and hybrid laser and air coupled UT systems for those occasions when we need to do contactless inspection or where we can't wet the part. We're going to int introduce eddy currents because one of the big challenges with eddy currents on complex geometry surfaces is keeping the orientation of the coil with respect to the surface at the right angle. And the robots are very good at helping us to do that. Um, of course, once we've collected all this data, the bottleneck could then become the analysis. And so uh, we can develop automated defect recognition and sentencing of the part. And the same AI technology can help us develop the most efficient scan path as well. And finally, we're hoping to introduce cobots. Cobots are cooperating robots, which can work within a, uh, an environment with humans uh, because they're, they're able to uh, uh, stop in the event that they collide with something or, um, uh, or, or with a human being. So it allows us to do robotic inspection, but without the need for a safety cell. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions from our partners within Intercom. The original program, um, in addition to TWI, we're, we're a partner too, we invest in the program too, uh, were Rolls-Royce and GKN, Bombardier Aerospace and uh, the RNLI. Um, but in phase three, we've been joined by new partner BAE Systems. Uh, so thanks to them for their contributions. And of course, this project isn't defined by TWI, the project is defined by the partners. So they very much take ownership of this program. And what makes it such a success is that uh, they decide what we do and we deliver things that are directly relevant and transfer into cost savings on the shop floor for the partners. We also take advantage of funding leverage from local government, in this case via our AMRI program, which is part funded by uh, EIDF and Welsh government. So, um, a practical example then of how we're going to deploy cobot systems. This isn't within Intercom. This is in a collaborative project known as Cflux, um, an Innovate UK collaborative program. And the partners you can see down on the right hand side, Ether, NDE, TWI, uh, FAR Composites, uh, Advanced Hall Sensors and, and Wright and Sons. And what the objective of this inspection is, is to be able to inspect green composites. So uh, composites before the cure with the idea that if there are wrinkles or faults uh, induced into the material as we lay it up, we can actually repair them before the, the layup goes into cure. So we can peel these things off and stick them back on again uh, in, in the correct way. And to do that, we need to have a, a method that doesn't contaminate the surface or in fact doesn't contact the surface. So electromagnetic methods uh, are the order of the day here, such as magnetic flux leakage and eddy current arrays. So the first task then was to get our cobot talking to our path planning software. And, and here you can see that being done. This is a universal robots um, cobot system. It's a tabletop design and uh, very reasonable cost. Uh, I think there's a waiting list though, so you'd have to put your name down. But here you can see that we've uh, um, got a model of the uh, of the robots operating environment and that enables us then to to start to plan um, the paths that the robot will follow to do the inspection. Uh, and so my final slide is to show you this thing working. So you can see mounted on the robot we've got a 3D printed yoke and in each arm of the yoke is an electromagnetic sensor. Um, in this case it's scanning a 3D printed uh, component which has got a number of metallic things attached to it just to give us uh, an initial indication. Uh, I know they're huge with respect to the part, but this was just the initial trial of the system. So 
Over here on the right hand side, uh, you can see our, um, our, our test equipment. And then over on the left hand side, uh, you can see our computer screen, which is receiving a live image of the uh, inspection. And this is uh, similar to our intercom software. It's a real live 3D uh, image of the part. So let me start the video uh, and you can see the scan. So in this case, the two transducers are maintained at a fixed distance apart because the component is uh, uh, of uniform thickness. And on the left hand side, you can see the image slowly building up as, uh, as we scan the component. So I, I won't torture you by making you sit through the whole scan, but uh, I, I guess you, you get the idea. Uh, and the great thing about this, of course, is it's done in an open laboratory. There's no need for a robotic safety cage, which also means if we can do it in an open lab, it also means that we can take it out into the workplace uh, and we can do this uh, in the production line without having to uh, to exclude people thanks Ian. that's that's really um really, really brilliant um i think what we'll do uh now uh is 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 open up uh for questions um i've got a number of them coming in um i'd, I'd like to ask the first question uh to both of you really and and that is what do you see as the uh, the, the next big step in autonomy and inspection. Are, are we waiting for soon new technology to come along to enable it, or is it already here today? Um, so, so who wants to answer that one first? I'll, I'll take that one. I, I, I think most things are small steps. Um, occasionally you do get a, a big technological leap, but that has to be integrated into somebody's process. So just because you have a new a bit of kit or a new um, technology, it's it's small incremental changes. I, I mentioned during my presentation that I'd heard that Lights Out Manufacturing was making a comeback. Um, I'm, I'm not sure Lights Out Manufacturing ever went away. It's just that um, Lights Out Manufacturing kind of assumes that people leave the workplace and turn the lights out and they're not there. Well, you can run Lights Out Manufacturing during the day so I think it's a case of, is there a bigger driver for that now? And if you're reshoring things, then yes, you can. It's lots of small things. Um, I think the flexibility, it, it's such an overused word, flexibility. But um, in, in the true sense of the word, you are being asked, manufacturers are now being asked to produce things in ever shorter runs. So you might have had a, a component in the past, which might have had a, a life in an internal combustion engine of between five and eight years. And that's just no longer the case. You can't um, amortize the tooling over a long period of time. So you're having to buy things. It's a crazy situation. You're having to buy things that will be capable of measuring something you haven't even seen yet. And that might seem impossible. Uh, and indeed, it almost is impossible. But you're looking to try and keep your options open, not not buying one bit of equipment that will just, just do one job and then have to throw it away at the end. You want to be able to repurpose it as much as you possibly can or, or refurbish it and, and use it as much as you possibly can. So to answer the question, what's, what's the next best thing? It's inevitably lots of little things that contribute um, uh, as is often the case. Thank you, Gareth. Ian, what's your take on the... the, the, well, the... Um, uh, I, I guess, uh, really, in terms of inspection, um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence is going to be something that's extremely important to the inspection industry, both in terms of being able to program the robots to, to use the most efficient path and to cope with uh, parts that... that vary continuously from the CAD data. So how, how do we deal with these things where they, they flex unpredictably, say, when they're taken out of the mold? We can use AI to help us to uh, derive scan paths on the fly where the probe actually provides feedback to the system so that it modifies the scan path as we go along. Next, we need to think about how we're gonna look at the data. Um, we need to think about remote data analysis where our expert is not necessarily on site. He's looking at that data elsewhere. And then we need to think about all the other uh, industry 4.0 aspects, such as cybersecurity and all those things, you know, how we maintain that, how do we store that data? How do we look at legacy systems and remain compatible as things evolve? Um, 
But also from the NDT perspective, it's a very well regulated industry. And so we can develop things generally a lot faster than we can get them accredited and proven as safe for use within within the space that they're intended to be used. And I'm thinking about the nuclear industry. I'm thinking about aerospace and those kinds of things. You know, but making fan covers and making water pump covers and things isn't quite the same thing. But when we're making structural components, there needs to be a level of integrity, assuredness that, that is really only born of experience with the process and the definition of standards and codes and standards that need to be followed. And this takes time, even after the technology has been developed. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, another question, really, to, to both of you. Um, as we move towards I-4.0, and we've seen some examples of that going on today, do you think that the integrated design tools that are in common use have that integrated approach to inspection yet? I suppose what I'm really asking here is with the development of AI that you've just mentioned, do we have that feedback from the inspection side all the way back to the design? Is that yet there yet? Where, where are we on that? Ian, I'll ask, I'll ask you that one first. Um, well, there's an appetite for that. And there are lots of small projects taking place all over the place that are, that are developing that. I'll give you an example. If you're, you're looking at additive manufacture, one of the great things would be to be able to detect flaws in each layer as you lay it down, rather than wait until the whole component's finished, invest a lot of time and effort in it and CT it and then find it's got some feature that, that you don't intend to, to be in the thing. So one of the, the things that, that TWI have been working on is looking at the melt pool, is looking at melt pool monitoring, because it also translates across the various additive manufacturing things, but also to welding like laser and EB welding processes. It's useful for that too. And we can look at uh, things like machine vision techniques to, to look at the dimensions of the melt pool. We can also integrate that with thermography where we take a spectral analysis of the heat signature of the pool and from those things, we're not looking necessarily to detect flaws as such, but we're looking at drift from the optimum parameters, as Gareth mentioned, that tell us that something is going, starting to go wrong with the process. And either if it's gone terribly wrong, we can stop the build and save ourselves some money, machine off the bad bit and, and continue. Or alternatively, we can correct for it in time so that we don't generate any scrap and we remain with intolerance. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd concur with with a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, just just to add to that, I think um, if if we rewind to the days of quality control versus quality assurance, so I, I always think of quality control as being your goalkeeper. He's the guy that stops those bad parts going out of the factory. Um, what you don't see is the scrap bin and the cost of of the pieces that you've created, which are no longer good to go out. So we moved to an, an era where people were trying to um, put things in place which would assure quality. Now, obviously, that comes at a cost. And I think what we're looking at here with a lot of the industry 4.0 is to identify cheaper ways of finding that out. You don't want to inspect everything on every component after every production process because clearly that adds an awful lot of cost it, it, it helps you get and identify the errors but that comes at a cost and I think it's about people looking at their own process and deciding if they want to employ these smart um, technologies if you're punching washers you don't care you just use the goalkeeper approach if you're um, producing um, expensive aerospace components which are potentially hundreds of thousands of pounds then you want to be pretty sure you want to measure twice and cut once as the old adage goes you want to be checking at every single point but not only that you want to take that data and do something with it you don't just throw the part away and then press the go button for the next one you use that data in a, in a clever way and I think the the, the AI um, is, is something which will evolve um, very quickly because I think people will take advantage of measuring lots and lots of data and then do incredibly clever things with it. Um, and I, I think to the point where we possibly can't even imagine, we're on, a, we're on an exponential curve here, we can't imagine what, what this might do for us. Um, it's getting much more towards a, a process where the process can make uh, intelligent decisions for itself that the human being possibly wouldn't be able to, which is which is it's just absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, brilliant. Um, can, kind of one, one, one final question, really. I mean, I've got these experts in front of me and, and we've got an audience out there. What would your advice be uh, to the manufacturing companies out there who are just starting out on their journey down this road? 
um, what would your kind of top tips be to them um, as they're on the, the start of that journey, Ian? I would say collaboration. One of the things that we find at, at TWI, uh, one of our key strengths is the fact that if we don't know something ourselves, we know who to go talk to. We generally know uh, through collaboration with universities uh, and through industrial uh, partners, um, there, there's usually an answer out there. And if, and if there isn't an answer, if we don't know the answer, by working collaborati collaboratively, we can solve the problem or search for the answer, firstly in a more cost-effective way, but, but, but also because the results that come out of that, the, the, the people who've invested in it are automatically bought into that idea. So it makes the, the creation of standards and things like that much simpler if we've got a, a, a common solution, if you like, to, to a problem. Thank you, Ian. Gareth, would you... I'm always nervous of giving people advice, you know, using your advice to, to spend their money. Um, but I think it, it, people, people, manufacturers know what they want to achieve. And I think keeping that clear objective is important and allowing their um, staff to operate within those parameters, having clear parameters. Uh, an example I have, we, we have been to... Um, admittedly large established companies found that when we introduce some of the advantages of using different sensors that's not in their department's gift to look at so you've segregated the departments into two one looking at one aspect one looking at another and it, because it's not their exam question it's not their responsibility I suppose the the benefit of if you're a startup is that you're probably wearing a few hats and you can oversee these sorts of things um, having clear clarity of purpose is, 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 is it's not a, a particularly insightful comment, but I, I see that as incredibly important. You're absolutely right. Uh, firstly, uh, as, as we come to the end of this session, so thank you both um, for your time and your inputs and a lot of experience there. Um, really insightful, uh, giving a um, good, good in-depth presentation of what's going on in the industry. Thank you to the audience uh, for listening. Um, as we talk about Industry 4.0, often much talked about and a buzzword, but what we've seen today is, is where we get some understanding from the real world, where the real world bites uh, with all its imperfections into back to that digital world of pureness. And where those two meet is a real interesting thing, especially when people are trying to make and produce something. And what's hit me is the time saved, the productivity increase, increase that's, that's benefited from this, but also the, the amount of data and tools that's going on around that. So that there's an awful lot of knowledge that knits this together. So thanks again for your time. Hope you've enjoyed the session. Um, contact details, etc., are available. I'm sure um, they'll be available to answer questions. So thanks once again. Hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thank you for joining the Emerging Tech Fest. Join us again on our virtual live sessions or watch us on playback anytime, anywhere.